Matthew. Yeah. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, we are very happy to have uh, Matteo Puel with us today. Um, <clears throat> so Matteo did both his bachelor's and his master's um, at the University of Trento in Italy. Um, before finishing his master's, he um, was an intern at Stockholm University in Sweden for three months. And um, uh, after finishing his master's, he also spent some time at CERN um, doing research before then in 2018. Um, he moved to Canada to pursue a PhD at McGill University in um, Toronto under the supervision of Jim Klein. Um, <clears throat> personally, I was lucky to meet Matteo in 2019 at uh, the ICTP Summer School on Particle Physics in Trieste in Italy. Um, yeah, and as I uh, had said before, um, <clears throat> uh, Matteo agreed to give this talk today. Uh, at the CC CPPC seminar, which we are very happy about, and um, that I hand over to you, Matteo. Thank going. you very much, uh, Tobias and Michael. For, like Tobias for this kind of for this kind of interaction, and uh, Michael and Tobias also for inviting me to present my work. Uh, so my name is Matteo Puel, and I'm a PhD student at McGill University. And the next 40, 45 minutes, if I uh, understood well, uh, I'll talk about my recent work on the possibility to use dark matter late time oscillations to turn Caspi dark matter halos into code ones. Um, and this work was done in collaboration with uh, my supervisor, Jim Klein, uh, together with uh, Guillermo Gambini from McGill and Sam McDermott from uh, Fermilab. Um, let me see. So this is the outline of the talk. So I'll start with a brief introduction to the topic and in particular focus on the um, problems that the Lambda CD and cosmological model has at small scales. And I'll explain a, a possibility to use dark oscillations to uh, solve at least one of these issues, the so-called core gas problem. Then we move to discuss the two phenological models that uh, we considered in the, in the paper and uh, um, and then just, and then we see the effects that it ha that they have on the, the early universe cosmology and on the galaxy evolution, and then I'll summarize uh, um, the main results in uh, in the conclusions. So I guess everyone knows that uh, we uh, the universe is mainly dark. Uh, so we know that most of the energy budget of the universe is completely unknown, and we have a good knowledge only of just the four five percent of the total energy budget of the universe, which is made up of visible matter and radiation. We have. Uh, <clears throat> We can estimate the such abundances uh, using exquisite data from the uh, and temperature and isotopy of the cosmic, the cosmic microwave background, and uh, which is just a snapshot of the universe uh, when it was 400,000 years old. And then the other set of data that we use to estimate the uh, amount of variance in the universe is the um, abundance of uh, light elements such as uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and their isotopes at the time of uh, the so-called Big Bang nucleosynthesis, so the first time when the, uh, these light elements uh, were formed. The CBBN and CMBD also estimate the abundance of the other main species uh, that, that made up of the, made up the universe, uh, which are dark energy and uh, dark matter. The former, the former is uh, um, responsible for the expansion of the universe and it represents roughly 70% of the energy budget of the universe, while the remaining 20, 25% is made of dark matter. And this is also the topic of this uh, talk. Um, the nice part about dark matter is that the simplest model to uh, take into account of all effects on cosmology is to assume that dark matter is made up of particles. Um, and for this reason, dark matter physics is, can be seen as an intersection between particle physics and cosmology. So in order to get the previous chart of the abundance of, the abundance of species in the universe, uh, we need to have a you know, um, cosmological model. And the simplest and the most successful one that we have is the so-called Lambda-CN uh, model, which is also known as the standard model of cosmology. 
Uh, this model is really simple because it has just six free, six free parameters that, has, that have to be fitted by the, uh, all the data that you have uh, about the universe. But it's also successful, not only because it can explain all the data, but also because it, it can reproduce the, the statistical distribution of galaxies in the universe at late redshift, uh, at, at, at uh, a small redshift. Um, this is nicely uh, pictured in uh, this, um, in this uh, figure. Um, where um, they come between the results of uh, embodied cosmological simulation made up of just uh, cold dark matter particles is shown in the um, red panels. It is compared with the observation of the galaxy redshift surveys, uh, in particular from the two degree uh, field the galaxy redshift surveys and the slow, uh, the slow and digital sky survey that are shown in the um, blue panels. So if you just compare the top and the bottom panel and with the bottom panel and the left with the right one, you can see that the, uh, the agreement is astonishing. Um, this is assuming the, the dark matter is made of uh, uh, cold particles, which are not, namely particles that are not relativistic at the time of the coupling from the primordial plasma. And I also forgot to mention that the lambda CDL cosmology uh, assumes that the dark energy is made of a dark matter, the cosmological constants. This is the simplest model, as I said, uh, to reproduce uh, fairly well all the data that we have. However, the simplicity of the lambda CDN cosmological model um, is, uh, suffers from some uh, disagreements at small scales, at so the scales of galaxies, so below uh, megaparsecs. And these are the so-called, the most, the famous, uh, most famous problems. Maybe the most famous one is the uh, core cast problem, which is the tendency of the simulations to produce CASP uh, dark, uh, dark matter um, density profiles, uh, especially um, in uh, dark galaxies, uh, which is in concert with observations that prefer uh, more core profiles. So profiles, density profiles that are remains constant uh, in the, the close to the center of the galaxies. And these cores are less pronounced in galaxy clusters. So if you go to larger systems, uh, the density is more shallower. Another problem that uh, is quite well known is the so-called missing satellite problems, um, uh, which is the overproduction of satellites from embodied simulations for Milky Way-like galaxies. Uh, and this is in contrast to the small number of uh, satellites that have been observed in the Milky Way. Another problem is also related to the Milky Way, like the, the, to the Milky Way satellites, is the so-called big to fail problems. Uh, namely, the satellites uh, seems to have um, uh, more mass or a la, uh, more peaked uh, density uh, profile um, than uh, in order to host the brightest galaxies, uh, the brightest satellites of the Milky Way or the Andromeda Galaxy. In fact, if the if those uh, surveillance would be uh, would be so massive, uh, we would have that they would have accreted a lot of uh, gas. It would have been collapsed, and they would have be produced stars. And so we would have observed those uh, subhalos uh, around the Milky Way Andromeda. So all these simulations, uh, all these simulations contain basically mostly at least uh, cold dark matter particles, so particles that are not interacting. Um, so one might wonder why, uh, so if you include baryonic physics, since uh, all these issues uh, appear at smaller scales, uh, if baryonic physics can help uh, to solve, uh, or at least to alleviate those, um, those problems. And the, the answer is partially. Uh, in particular, you can alleviate all these three problems, but only for dark galaxies that uh, have a large star content, so um, star mass that is larger than 10 to the 7. So there were a lot of, so in this talk, I will focus mainly on the uh, core cast problem um, and see what, how we can solve it. So the most of the standard, I would say, you know, a new physics explanation to the core cast problem now also on the... It's quite well known that self-interacting dark matter can first cord uh, galactic profiles. And the reason is to use scatterings between um, high energetic particles that uh, belong basically in the outskirts of the galaxy and low velocity particles that are in the middle. 
Um, this is also well um, demonstrated using uh, embody uh, cosmological simulation. These are just two references, old references where it was foreshown. Um, it has been shown also that uh, in order to explain uh, all, the observable, all the observations across different systems, uh, um, an elastic cross section for self interacting in diameter between 0 0.1 centimeter square per gram is needed, um, which is like consistent with the body cluster constraint, uh, which is the constraint coming from the merging of uh, clusters uh, that, uh, that requires a cross section that is smaller than 0 0.7. However, there are some caveats with this um, with this uh, bound, uh, and it can also be uh, relaxed a little bit. However, more recently, um, uh, it was it was been shown that uh, velocity dependence scattering cross section uh, of the Yukawa type, uh, namely that the cross section goes uh, drops at large velocity and becomes constant at low velocity. Uh, can fit nicely uh, all the, the systems, including uh, galaxy clusters. So the, our idea was to uh, exploit um, another type of process instead of scattering, uh, which is annihilation. And the reason why we use annihilation instead of scattering is because annihilation is also an exothermic process like um, CDM, like self-interacting dark matter. And in particular, it mimics the velocity dependence of the scattering cross section uh, because we know that the, uh, uh, the annihilation cross section becomes constant plus more velocity. However, using annihilation, uh, so annihilation suffers from some challenges. Uh, and in particular, uh, annihilation is also used uh, in the standard uh, freeze up mechanism uh, in order to set the radical abundance. So uh, we need to uh, find a way in order to have that annihilation go out of the equilibrium at early times and set the, uh, the radical abundance that we observe today, uh, and then recommence at late times. And then another problem is that annihilation has a lot of uh, constraints. So the matter annihilation is constrained by a lot of observables, in particular, the, mo the most stringent constraint from CMB on the change of um, the dark uh, matter the rate density. Um, and so we need to be, um, we need to satisfy all these constraints in order to use uh, uh, the annihilation. And one possible solution that we had in our paper was to uh, assume to have a symmetric dark matter with a small number violating mass term that I know that as delta M that is uh, responsible to cause uh, oscillations between particle and antiparticles at late times. And in particular, it can be shown that it just by solving the quantum Boltzmann equation that comes out, that the efficiency of these oscillations depends a lot on the density. So it means that this process is efficient in uh, high density regions like galaxies, and it's completely negligible uh, elsewhere. So um, we considered our two phenological models. Uh, in particular, we call model one a coupling between the dark matter with a lighter vector boson, uh, where the Lagrangian is like that. And the dark matter phase out and the late time diffusion in galaxies can be achieved by the annihilation of dark matter into uh, two vector bosons. Then we consider, so we assume the dark matter is a fermions. Um, and uh, I call here quasi dark fermions because we see that we need to have a Majorana mass term in order to cause oscillations. So the, um, the second model that we consider is a coupling between dark matter with the lighter vector boson, uh, the sort of light, lighter complex scalar field, um, which I denote as phi, and the Lagrangian is uh, like that. And the dominant annihilation channel for this, um, for this part, for this uh, uh, coupling, is uh, the annihilation of chi into uh, chi chi bar into the scale and up to the scale component. And of course, both models must have a Majorana mass term uh, in order to cause oscillations at late times. So we introduced this parameter delta m that describes the oscillations between particle and antiparticle. Before uh, looking at what could be the effects on uh, the value of the new universe and on the uh, evol galaxy evolution. Let me just uh, stop a little bit and um, do some analytical estimates to see what kind of what part of the parameter space we are in. So um, let me just uh, prime as the dark fine structure constant, which is the usual definition. So the uh, interaction cap squared divided by four pi. And so the nucleation cross-section uh, at the threshold for both, um, for both models 
uh, can be parameterized like uh, can be uh, found in this form. And in particular, it becomes um, dependent on the square of the uh, dark fine structure constant of a prime and inversely proportional to the square of the dark matter mass. Similarly, the elastic cross section at low velocity, because we are interested in galaxies where the velocity of the dark matter particle is much smaller than the speed of light, uh, can be uh, found in the, to be in uh, this form. Uh, and as you can see for both models, uh, that it, it becomes quadratic dependent on the alpha prime, quadratic dependent on the dark matter mass and inversely proportional to the fourth power of the mediator. Um, so if we just compare the annihilation cross section uh, and we um, assume that it's of the same order of the scattering cross section, the, the limit that we bound in the scattering cross section we have from observations, so one a centimeter square per gram, and we take like a Milky Way like galaxy where the velocity uh, dispersion is around hundreds of kilometers per second, we can find a, um, a relationship between alpha prime at the dark prime structure constant and the dark matter mass. Then also, if since we want to test the annihilation instead of scattering, uh, we have to assume that the annihilation dominates over scattering. And if we do so, and we take as a reference uh, uh, step where we have lost it's per thousand kilometers per second, we get a bound on the ratio between the mediator mass and the dark matter mass. Furthermore, we have also another parameter that we introduced, which was the, um, the dark matter violating mass term, uh, the demanded number violating mass term that time. And we have the most stringent constraints on those parameters. In particular, we need to require that the, the oscillations recouple before, or at least at the time of structure formation, uh, which occurs around 100 mega years, uh, which sets a lower bound on the, 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 the delta M. And then we need to be inconsistent with the CMB constraints on the change of the dark matter like density, uh, which sets an, up, an upper bound that depends on the uh, model. So as you can see, delta M is really, really tiny. Um, so since we uh, discuss particle oscillations, let me just uh, give a small introduction about the, at least the main points of the oscillation formalism that we used, uh, that we can use. Uh, so within the particle uh, oscillation framework, uh, we know that the distinction between particle and the particle becomes time dependent. And in particular, if we uh, choose a basis uh, for simplicity where chi is one zero and uh, the antiparticle is uh, zero one, we can uh, we can see we can we know that the evolution of the chi as a function of time or the state chi as a function of time, if we start from a single particle state chi, it um, uh, it, it is oscillating in time. And in particular, it's oscillate, it, it oscillates with a phase phi uh, that it's related to the Majorana mass term that we presented earlier. This is assuming there is no interaction. And also this state has an associated density matrix of this form here, but this applies just for one single particle. Um, when instead we uh, consider a thermal bath, so um, a group of particles, um, this um, density matrix has to be replaced by an integral over the matrix distribution function f uh, for states of momentum k. So we know we can see that the density uh, the density matrix m um, becomes uh, it becomes the integral of the uh, matrix distribution function uh, over the momenta, and then we have the usual um, the general C factor uh, in front. Only the differences between the standard approach and uh, uh, at least the standard approach for Boltzmann, for solving Boltzmann equations and uh, uh, these so-called quantum Boltzmann equations is that there are off the diagonal terms on the density matrix. And these of the diagonal terms keep track of the coherence between the pure state sky and uh, the pure state uh, bar chi. So if we don't have uh, off the diagonal terms, and we have just the diagonal one, we'll, re, uh, we'll uh, get the usual Boltzmann equation for particle and antiparticle. So it has been shown that um, the, when, you, when you introduce interactions between particle and antiparticle, uh, something changes. And in particular, uh, what the annihilations depends a lot on the type of interaction. It was nicely presented by Sean Tulin at all in 2012. 
And in particular, the type of interaction um, can be uh, distinguished uh, depending on uh, how, on how, on if the, La, um, the Lagrangian change is signed under uh, the charge conjugation transformation. So if the Lagrangian change is signed when we go from chi to uh, its antiparticle, uh, the interaction is called flavor sensitive. And one example of this flavor sensitive interaction is the vector interaction, like of this form of the form that we uh, use in our paper. If instead the Lagrangian cannot distinguish between particle and antiparticles, when we, so when we make the uh, um, uh, charge conjugation transformation, the Lagrangian doesn't change sign, the interaction is called flavor blind. And one particular example uh, for this flavor blind interaction is the scalar interaction. So in our paper, we consider both types of interaction. One, the flavor sensitive interaction, and for model two, the scalar interaction here. So if you apply this formalism to our model, I don't write the full Boltzmann equation because I don't think it, it's, uh, it, at least it's easy to understand, but I, I just like uh, pick, like uh, summarize the, the main results. Um, for, the, for the flavor sensitive interaction, which is model one, where we have the denigration, the dominant denigration channel is the dark matter into two vector, in a pair of vector bosons. It's uh, possible to show from the quantum Boltzmann equation that the annihilation scattering becomes proportional to the difference in the phases. So I denote phi and phi prime the phases that uh, each particle has, and can and if uh, it project uh, the, the particle to a state to a pure state like chi or, or bar chi, can tell us if it is a particle or antiparticle. And th so you can easily see that um, the annihilation becomes so becomes important only if uh, the two particles uh, have opposite different phases. And the, the phases um, evolve in time according to these relations here, uh, where you can see the evolution depends strongly on the uh, scattering uh, rate. And the scattering rate for the type of, the, for the type of models that we considered um, is a linear proportion to the velocity. So you can easily see that um, the effects of annihilation will become stronger in model one, instead with large velocity dispersions. And it seems quite disfavored from observation where uh, the, at least the core class problem in, um, the uh, of uh, depletion in the core of galaxies is more evident in a smaller system like DARF than a larger system like clusters. For the flavor blind interactions so for model two, where we have the scalar interaction and the dominant annihilation channel is the one into the scalar and the scalar, um, the, uh, it is possible to show from the quantum Boltzmann equation that the annihilation scattering, uh, the initialization rate uh, becomes proportional to the sum of the phases. So this means that um, also if the two particles are, are in phase with each other, uh, the annihilation can occur. And the phases evolve uh, similarly to what uh, happens before, but now the, 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 the phase, uh, the evolution becomes proportional to the annihilation uh, rate which is a velocity independent for in the case of galaxies where the velocity is really small. And we expect that uh, the scalar model will provide um, results that are more in agreement with observations. So let me just show some results. Uh, and in particular, let me just focus on the cosmological evolution of the, the particle and the particle uh, in, the, um, in the early universe. And I choose just to show the results for model two for the scalar interaction because the, for model one, um, the evolution is basically the same. But at least it shows the same features. Um, so on the y-axis here, I have the commoving density uh, y, uh, which is defined as the ratio between the uh, density, uh, the number density and the entropy density. All of them are in commoving units uh, as a function of uh, the quantity x, uh, which is the ratio between the Dirac mass, uh, the Dirac Dermatic particle mass, and chi, and the temperature of the universe. So the quantity x is a measure of the time, because the universe expands and it cools down. So the temperature will drop uh, with time. So let, we we started with, so we have an asymmetric dermatic model, so we have to start with an initial symmetry uh, that I called uh, between particle and antiparticle that I call eta that dark matter, which is, you can see, is quite small. Um, and so when the temperature of the universe drops below roughly 1 20th of the part, uh, dark matter mass, 
uh, we have uh, that, that there is only one way to have annihilation so that we have just the, uh, we can produce any more dark matter, uh, dark matter and, uh, and its corresponding antiparticle, but you can produce just the mediators. And so uh, we have that, um, that the symmetric component of, uh, of, the, of the dark matter uh, get depleted. Uh, so get annihilated and produce um, mediators. And so the, uh, what we have left is just a symmetric component uh, that gets squeezed out uh, because the temperature in the universe becomes too, uh, too low uh, to uh, get annihilations. And we are in commuting units, so the density remains constant. So when the temperature at the end becomes smaller than uh, a certain, it becomes smaller than uh, the corresponding time uh, that is inversely proportional to the uh, small number violating mass turned at M, uh, annihilations recommence uh, for a while. Um, so the oscillations recommence, annihilation recouple briefly uh, before freezing out again. And this briefly, this uh, change, this reduction on the Y uh, is for most uh, choice of for, mo for most of the choice of the parameters uh, space, it's below five percent. So it becomes consistent with uh, CNB constraints, and this reduction in the density can have some implication probably uh, in the H naught and the sigma eight tensions that are quite the main tensions now in the uh, modern cosmology. Uh, so on the I, I didn't mention here that the. Um, uh, with the blue line and showing the abundance of uh, dark matter particle, uh, with the orange line, the abundance of antiparticle, and the sum instead is shown in uh, black. And also, I show for comparison the time when BBN and CNB uh, occur. Um, in, in order to make comparison. So if we uh, reduce the value, if we increase the value of that M, uh, the change the recapping between uh, the, the uh, recapping of oscillations and the uh, consequent annihilations becomes earlier and can be in a disagreement with simply constraints. Let me now just move uh, to the um, structure formation part. So in order to study what, what is the effect on the galaxy evolution uh, for this model. And in our paper, we used two different uh, complementary approaches. One of them was to solve numerically the quantum Boltzmann equation uh, for an already formed Navarro Fenton white profile, a certain time t0, and uh, whose density of profiles is shown here. And we started with an initial condition where we have just particles. And then we followed the Boltzmann uh, uh, evolution uh, for, the, uh, for the total density uh, rho chi. Uh, after uh, for ten one hundred for uh, uh, for ten giga years, and then for the model one, since we need to have uh, some information about the velocity, we took the velocity dispersion from the analytic uh, results from our front and y profile. Then we use another approach, which was to uh, perform embodied galactic simulation that are quite controlled and uh, started from an initial NHS profile. So the LKS profile is very similar to the Navajo friend web profile. In particular, we use a matching condition for the parameters in order to have that they uh, perfectly agree in the region of uh, uh, in the region space where we are interested in. And you use the LKS profile because they are stable. Uh, so to create the mass and because the mass is finite for this halo. And so it allows us to uh, generate uh, initial conditions that are stable uh, for time, uh, across the time. So these are the results uh, for the coming from the Boltzmann equation. Um, so in the top plot, I'm showing the density profile as a function of the distance for, uh, for a dark system on the left uh, and a galaxy cluster on the right. And these are results for the vector mediator where I uh, fixed all the parameter except for the uh, vector mass uh, and B. Um, so on the with the uh, blue with the black line, I'm showing the initial cusp diameter halo, the, the Navarro friendly web profile where uh, that we start with, uh, and with dot dashed lines with different colors, I'm showing the results by changing the value of MV. And the orange line represents the best fit uh, for uh, the self-interacting dark matter model with a velocity dependence scattered intersection that is tuned uh, to um, to reproduce the results for those uh, for these systems. Uh, I don't want, I, I don't like, I, I'll explain later uh, the differences between uh, these lines and how they agree with observations. But right now, I want to just to um, 
light that um, the dermatite annihilation can successfully turn the cusp dermatite halos from the, like the Navarro friendly web profile into cold ones, like CDM does. Um, these, are, these are the same results for the scalar mediator model, uh, where I fixed parameters except for alpha prime. And I vary alpha prime according um, in order to show what are the effects by changing this parameter. And for the, for the scalar model, alpha prime is the only parameter that is important uh, because the mass of the mediator uh, becomes negligible. It's, it's not uh, important uh, since uh, we, we saw that the oscillations and the consequent annihilation depends strongly on the, um, and the, the oscillation depends strongly on the annihilation and not on the scattering. So here instead, I, uh, I uh, added the results coming from the embody galactic simulations. Uh, and for the, all the, for the both system, the, uh, the DARF system on the left and the galaxy cluster on the right. And on the top, we have the results from the vector mediator model one and on the bottom, the results from model two. And as you can easily see the results, the two uh, results uh, agree really well. Uh, so the, the two approaches, um, even though they are complementary, uh, they're not the same, uh, but they agree really well. And so we were quite happy about the, uh, the robustness of the results that we got. One thing to notice is that the differences between uh, the dashed red line and the uh, black line. And the dashed red line is the Eric's profile that we used uh, in the simulations, the initial halo uh, that we used in the simulations. And the uh, Navarro Fent web profile is the halo that we use in order to solve both an equation. And as you can see in the region of, uh, that we are interested in, um, these two halo agree really well. Uh, before like uh, showing the comparison with real data, let me just stop a little bit and discuss for a few minutes uh, the differences between dark matter particle, uh, the dark matter uh, scatterings and uh, annihilations in the context of uh, depleting the, um, this, the density, uh, the, the central density. And so on the, let, let me focus first on the right, uh, on the left plots, uh, where I show the density profiles for the dark galaxy uh, that I considered earlier. And with and body simulation, I can split the effects, uh, the, uh, the contribution from scattering, this, from scattering to, uh, uh, from annihilation. And uh, the contribution from scattering is the line just below for both, uh, for both cases, the line, the line just below the um, CDM, the black line. So I started earlier from an Ericus profile and evolved for uh, 10 giga years, um, the simulation with just only cold amateur hours is just a result. When instead I turn off uh, annihilation and just leave scattering, I, I get the curve that is just below uh, the cold dark matter line. And, uh, and the other two lines is that corresponds to the annihilation contribution and the total contribution when includes scattering and annihilation. And as you can see for both cases, um, the scattering contribution is quite negligible compared to annihilation. And so the, um, the, the possibility to turn uh, Caspi uh, profiles for, uh, to cold ones is just achieved by annihilation. In, uh, if I look instead at the uh, right plots, uh, here I'm showing the radial uh, dispers uh, velocity dispersion for the same system with the same color coding that I used uh, on the left. And uh, we know that scattering um, produces a, a transfer of heat between the uh, outer region uh, of the galaxies towards the inner region. And this leads to an increase in the velocity dispersion of particles that are within, uh, like close to the core. Uh, and these are the results from the scattering, it is quite well known. Uh, but this uh, change in the velocity dispersion is quite unaffected instead at large distances. If we have instead annihilation, uh, we don't have an increase in the velocity dispersion uh, at uh, smaller distances, but we have an overall reduction of the velocity dispersion of the velocity of particles across the entire halo. And this is because um, high energetic part, uh, high velocity particles have a higher chance to, to uh, meet another uh, particle and to annihilate. Um, and so the result is that the halo becomes colder than the, C the CDM case. So if I wanna, however, the density profile is not a, measure, a measurable quantity, so we can like observe that directly, uh, but we can, what we can observe is 
the rotation of that system, uh, which is the circular velocity for dark galaxies, and it's a core projected stellar velocity dispersion along the line of sight, which has this definition here. So everyone, I guess, knows the rotation curve, which is just a, a square root of the mass, the enclosed mass in the galaxy as a function of radius over the radii. Uh, for the projected stellar velocity dispersion, uh, it's a quantity that it's related to the baryonic content of the galaxy. And in particular, um, it depends on the um, stellar surface density sigma star here. Uh, and we have to have a good knowledge also on the uh, observe of the instruments that they uh, use to observe uh, those galaxies because it has uh, some because it depends on the geometry of this fleet that is used to measure them, which is parameterized by a. Um, and in particular, if the surface, the stellar surface density sigma is related to the uh, stellar luminosity density, a new, which is related to the baryonic content, to the baryonic density in the galaxy through the stellar uh, lumina, the stellar to mass ratio uh, epsilon. Here is in the V band as an observational measure. So we need to we need to model the baryonic content in the galaxy in order in the in the galaxy in the dark galaxy in the Cluster of in the cluster of galaxies in order to uh, convert our results into, um, into uh, observable quantities and compare them with observations. So we follow the same procedure that was developed uh, in the literature in order to, um, in to, in order to model what we counted for the cluster of galaxies that we uh, consider here. And these are the results where I convert the previous uh, results for the density profiles into observable quantities here. On the left, I'm showing the uh, circular velocity the rotation curve for the dark system that we considered. And on the right, uh, the stellar luminosity, the, st the projected stellar uh, luminosity, um, stellar velocity dispersion along the line of sight. So let me just now just let me just focus on the uh, top right plot here, the top right left plot here. Um, as you can see, um, the so I'm comparing the results which are shown with the uh, dot flash lines and the um, uh, solid lines here with the results from with the, the observations and the observations are shown with the uh, with the black uh, dots and the white dots. The black dots are the uh, observations, so what we can measure, uh, the rotation curve that is measured from observation, and the white dots instead are just the dramatic contribution that is uh, uh, inferred by modeling correctly the baryonic content, uh, the star content, the gas content in the uh, in the dark galaxy. So. Uh, you can easily see that the CN curve and the, the CN and the blue curve um, fit nicely uh, the data. Uh, and this corresponds to a value of MV that is uh, close to 34 MeV. But if we take, if we compare that to the same value of MV, which is the brown curve on the right, uh, that corresponds to 34 MeV, uh, it fails, the, the, the brown curve fails to fit the data, the cluster data. And in particular, a larger value of MV will be needed to fit equally well uh, the cluster data. This is for the vector mediator models for model one. If I just go uh, in the, if I just look at the bottom plots uh, for the scalar mediator model two, um, a value of alpha prime close to 0 0.1 uh, is uh, 0 0.01. It, it fits nicely the cluster data, uh, as you can see here, where the, the the data are the uh, um, gray rectangles. And, but a smaller value of alpha prime will be needed to fit equally well the dark data. So you can easily see that uh, there is a qualitative trend uh, that comes out from these results. So the Casper suppression in clusters is uh, more efficient in model one in the vector mediator model, while the suppression in DARPs is more efficient in the second model in the scalar mediator model. So the possible solution that we had in mind was to consider a model with uh, both mediators. So it's a so-called hybrid model where we have a scalar mediator and a vector mediator. And we, in these plots, I'm showing a choice, an example of model parameters uh, that can, um, that can quant like, quant not quantitatively, but just qualitatively uh, show uh, how our um, hybrid model can um, can fit the data across different uh, different uh, systems. Uh, 
In particular here, I'm, sure I'm taking a uh, dark matter mass that is 65 MeV, so it's smaller than one that I considered earlier. A vector mass is 44 with alpha prime, uh, uh, alpha and stature constant 0 0.015. Uh, and for the, for the scalar model, alpha prime of 0 0.004. And as you can see for the dark uh, galaxy, um, we have that the scalar mediator model uh, has a large, larger contribution uh, compared to the uh, vector mediator model that is almost negligible. So because it uh, follow the Navarro friendly wide initial, initial profile, initial result. And for the cluster instead, it's the opposite behavior. So the vector mediator model dominates, uh, gives the largest contribution uh, to the data. So let me conclude that the remaining annihilation in clusters uh, in, in, uh, in galactic structure can at least successfully uh, the cusps uh, in, the, in the model that we consider, which, is, which was a symmetric term matter. Uh, with a small, a small number violating mass term. And we illustrated the results uh, with two general models, the vector and scalar mediator. So the two types of interaction that are important in uh, particular oscillations. And uh, the annihilations so have a, a, a twofold um, uh, uh, action. So one, it freezes out. So it allows to freeze out the, and to set the radical abundance that we observed today and to deplete the symmetric uh, dramatic component. And then it uh, allows to uh, reactivate the late times uh, by uh, dermatic particle oscillations into antiparticle. So we showed, we consider a small a part of the parameter space where we, um, where we took the annihilation cross-section of the same order of magnitude of the upper bound that we have on the scattering cross-section. And we show that it can fit, uh, fit quite well the data uh, for uh, a mediator and dark matter mass between 30 and 100 MeV with a perturbative coupling and with a, a small number with a very tiny uh, delta M. And then we uh, saw that the scalar mediators can have a stronger effect uh, in, the, in uh, depleting the core of galaxies in the density profile, the central density profile of galaxies in small galaxies, in small system. Well, the mediator one is that has the opposite effect. So it has larger effect on uh, larger, larger systems. And the possibility to uh, explain the diversity of higher profiles on all scales might be achieved by combining, by having a model with a combination of both mediators. However, it requires a, a more uh, deep uh, investigation and it's something that we are planning to do uh, in the future. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and really I'm really open for questions. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Matteo, for your nice talk. Um, we have time for questions. So um, just unmute yourself and speak up or raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, there's one question. Uh, Deep Gosh, please go ahead. Uh, so thank you for your nice talk. Uh, so uh, my question is uh, that in your work, you didn't consider any explicit model for uh, getting the asymmetric dark matter at the first place. So now uh, the oscillations you, you are considering, if that happens at the epoch of formation of dark asymmetric dark matter itself, then uh, there won't be asymmetric dark matter at the first place. So from this fact, you can put some bound on the daily time you have considered. So uh, that would be a natural uh, bound on daily time. So, what yeah, that's what that's about? definitely that, that. Yeah, thank you very much for the for the question. Yes, that's the for the comments. That, that's definitely true. We didn't like consider a full uh, model, like how you complete a model, or we explain how we get uh, the the the, the, uh, the symmetric um, uh, abundance uh, in the first place. And, uh, and because we wanted to be as, as general as possible and to get constrained basically from cosmology and from, uh, in, in our case, mainly from uh, CMB and from the possibility to have these recoupling uh, late times. And that's definitely true that if we consider a specific model, uh, we can get other constraints uh, because they can affect like BBN and other uh, observables. And that's definitely true. Um, but we wanted to stay as general as possible. Um, but it's definitely true that you can have a larger, like more constraints if you consider a specific model. Can I ask another one? Uh, uh, yeah, of course. Okay. Yes. okay. So 
it's about the boltzmann system so when you solve yeah. uh, for boltzmann system have you considered the flavor basis or mass basis because you have uh, shown that for density matrix in the flavor basis uh, the matrix is off diagonal so uh, yeah so, so how do you uh, how many equation you have to solve for to so get... i can yeah so i can show you at least the main equations for both models uh, i decided to put in the main presentation because i don't think they are so enlightening but in principle there are four um, because we have the two diagonal terms for particle and the particle and for the off diagonal elements so we have a two, a two by two matrix. Um, so N is a two by two matrix uh, where you have the uh, diagonal terms, the particle and the particle. And then we have the off diagonal ones. Uh, so this is the main equation uh, that contains, especially for the vector model we, where the scattering uh, plays a, an important role, uh, which is, so, sorry here, I made a type but should be scalar. Hmm. Um, so, Scattering plays a leading role in the vector mediator model uh, because, as I, sh I showed you earlier, at least the main points of the oscillation formalism, uh, that uh, the annihilations, uh, the, the the changes of phases in the particle, uh, because each particle has a phase uh, that evolves with time, mm -hmm. uh, as delta m times t. Usually, there is no interaction, but when they interact, um, they uh, they depend also on the scattering uh, rate. And uh, the scattering rate is the responsible to uh, make uh, to have a to have annihilations uh, at the end. For the scalar models that we have just annihilation, and this is the what what was shown by Sean Tu in his paper in 2012. Okay. But in principle, yes. So we solve four uh, equations, um, and it's uh, just equations for the for the galactic for the galactic part. We can drop the and uh, the and uh, and uh, the uh, the, the equivalent uh, density uh, because it's not relevant in that regime. Mm. And then we have to make some changes. But yeah, okay. these are. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, um, more questions or comments? Can I ask you one question? So that, that's yeah, sure. a bit more about the model and so on. So, I, um, so with those, so your dark matter is annihilating into those vector particles or into those scalar and axial or pseudoscalars. Yeah. Um, so what, what do those vectors and so on annihilate further? Are, are they, do they annihilate further? Or do yeah, they that, further? That's, a, that's a really good question. I, I didn't mention, but that's definitely true. So if, uh, if they will annihilate into standard model particles at the end, uh, or at least they will decay in standard model particles, those mediators, uh, we have the stronger constraint from X-ray and uh, from X-ray observations. So we are like, um, so essentially we have nine order of magnitudes that die detection, that in data detection like put constraints on our model. So we had to assume that like they decay uh, invisibly or at least at least they decay in dark, in dark sector particles. And the easiest way is to assume that these, these mediators decay into stellar neutrinos uh, with a mass larger than a few EV. Um, in order to be uh, the change in the number of degrees of freedom coming from CMB and uh, um, and that, so yeah, of course the the mediators must decay visibly, unfortunately, okay. because yeah. So and it would be possible to decay them into neutrinos, or would that be? We haven't discussed that. Uh, that. That's definitely true. If they decay into neutrinos, there are not a lot of constraints. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there we could be some constraints from supernova or something, uh, however, uh, because we have another channel here. Um, in addition to at least annihilation, so that we have some constraints from the supernova 1987A. Um, but we haven't, we haven't uh, studied that. Uh, I don't know if there could be further constraints on uh, if they can decay into neutrinos only. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah, at least for sure not in, in gamma rays. Mm -hmm. For sure not in photons um, yeah. because we have the, the stronger constraints from that in that detection. But into neutrinos, I'm not so sure. Uh, we have to check that. Yeah, thanks. 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 You're welcome. Um, 
more questions or comments? Hi, yeah, um, I have a question about the more um, Halo profile side. So um, I understand that this is, the, um, what you've done so far is not considered baryon physics like concurrently, right? So yeah, is, there, is there a danger of kind of double counting this and baryon physics if you do them together and then you end up over smoothing the core or having too much damping um, effect? Is this able to kind of it's... dial down at least? Yeah, it's possible. We didn't consider, so we just consider simulation with uh, cold, with other metal particles that are like modified in order to take into account annihilations, oscillations, and scattering. And also, we consider just an isolated halo. So we evolved the simulation for an isolated halo, and we didn't include the interactions between like tidal interaction from uh, external galaxies or satellite galaxies. And it's something that we wanted to do uh, later, uh, at least depending on the results of this project. Um, but if you include baryons, you're definitely true, especially if you include supernova feedback and star formation. Um, it's possible that we have to change our parameters accordingly uh, and make to make them a uh, smaller effect of coming from annihilation. Uh, like physics can already um, turn at least the, the caspi element halos into cold ones. Um, but it's especially in the, in the central region and uh, at least a bit farther away from the uh, central region, uh, I think we need to have an equation of the level. So we, it's something that we are thinking to do to include the baryons. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have to change a little bit the parameters in order to make them consistent with observations. That's true. Okay, but there's nothing like, there's no like lower bound on these parameters. There's no reason that they can't be tuned down, right? I'm... No, that's not true. Yeah, that's true. Okay. At least we, we consider we consider just a, a dark matter mass of 100 MeV and not larger than that. So one way I wonder why not 100 GV. And the reason that we wanted to avoid strong interaction, um, especially like it's it's highly possible that it would be a like QCD <clears throat> like phase also in the dark sector, um, and so we wanted to avoid all those uh, technicalities, all these difficulties. But I guess it's possible if we can reach a little bit the initial model in the initial two models. I guess it's possible to make to have more room uh, to fit nicer the data. All right, great, thanks. You're welcome. Um, I have a more general question. Um, so you're considering massive vector bosons, right, in your model one. I'm just wondering, yeah. um, in general, you know, that's, of course, on a theory side, might be an issue to kind of embed it into a larger gauge group and these things yeah. to make sure that yeah. the theory remains renormalizable. I don't know if this, can that be an issue at all for the masses that you so the, the, we can, as I said, we consider just two phenomenological models. In particular, if you look at the Lagrangian, that let me just move there. Um, uh, yeah, if you look just at this Lagrangian, there are already some issues here because <clears throat> first, uh, dark matter number number uh, number dense number uh, the dramatic number uh, um, charge is not conserved because of this Majoran small Majorana mass term, so it's a breaking term. And also gauge invariance is not, is not uh, satisfied here. In particular, in the vector model is this Tuckelberg mass for the vector boson um, that allows, doesn't allow to get gauge invariance. So the, the idea in order to get that, uh, to get those masses like in a natural way is to have a uh, Higgs-like mechanism also in the dark sector. But we didn't like um, enrich the model like by adding other particles like a uh, double, sc uh, uh, double scalar um, because uh, we wanted just to be like, we wanted just to say what are the effects. At least we can get those masses in some way from the theory side in a more like consistent way. Um, but at least when analysis was mainly phenomenological, so we didn't like discuss how these terms were raised in the first place. But it's definitely true, at least the re recompletion and like renormalization or whatever is something that we have to take into account. Okay, thanks. That makes sense. Especially specific, yeah, if you consider a specific model. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. Um, someone else maybe wants to comment or ask a question?
if I not maybe we can question sorry there's so, yeah. okay so, so so you considered both that kind of this model with the scalar and the model with the vector boson so i i'm just wondering if you have if you hix your as well so if you have a theory with a complex scalar which then generates the mass of the vector boson um via the hicks mechanism could, could that be could that be that combination of model one and two or not really because you need the charge of the yeah uh, it, I, guess, it's, I guess not i guess not no no i, I guess not so I, I, I yeah i i don't think because scalars at least we uh, okay so we, in particular we consider like this type of scalars so a uh, scalar pseudo scalar component instead of like two scalars and and the reason it's because uh otherwise the adhesion will be p weight suppressed so it mm. doesn't like yeah. it doesn't give any it, it's, it's suppressed by the velocity of the particles in the, the galaxy and this is instead the only combination where we have a S wave. So it's, the annihilation dominates um, and it's, it's different from zero at small velocity. So I don't know, I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, I, we haven't, at least I haven't thought about like including other particles in the model, uh, like a complex scalar, uh, like to make the heat, to have a Higgs like a mechanism to get those masses. But I don't know, I don't think they will impact uh, the results that we got. Um, yeah. In any case, I think Stückelberg is fine. So her, yeah. it, it's consistent for U one symmetry. It's consistent. Yeah, it's it's true, Alice. We we, we didn't like go into the model building uh, stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but we we know that this kind of type of interaction are quite uh, overall present in a lot of models. Uh, so we wanted just to test what are the effects uh, for those interactions with a like focus on a particular model. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you don't introduce an axial vector coupling, you are fine. That's yeah. Consistent, the theory. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it, it might have some implications when you consider a model with both couplings, maybe. Um, but I don't know. At least we haven't like, considered it because it's quite difficult also to implement in the simulations like a doubly, uh, a doubly uh, uh, theaters. It's not so simple. Ah. Oh, oh, of course, of but, course, that makes it more complicated. Yeah, course, yeah. Right. So you wanted just like to give some ideas uh, of how it might uh, happen. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, I think it's already past 5 p.m. here. Maybe we can...